Welcome to our next hit of Between the Lines, our vodcast slash podcast crossover with World Rugby's Inside the 22 series. I'm Sean Money, and joining me for the next little bit, a long favourite of mine, former All Blacks captain, World Rugby Hall of Famer, and looking resplendent in his Laureus polo shirt, Sean Fitzpatrick. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good, Shawnee. It's nice to, to wake up, um, to have something in the diary, to, to have a shave, um, to put on some, <laughs> some nice clothes uh, for, a lot, for, for a change and to hear a different voice in the house. So good to have you in our house, Shawnee. A couple of Sean's about to get us through the next uh, 20 odd minutes. Run me through the whole Laureus thing. What's the best way that you can sort of bring that together in your role there with Laureus? And what does Laureus do? Because I hear plenty of very good things from that organisation. Uh, yeah, we were set up uh, 20 years ago, hence the, the logo. This is the, the 20 logo for 20 years. Uh, we started in 2000. We were set up to se celebrate excellence in sport. Uh, former uh, sportswoman, sportsman who had sort of dominated in their respective sports. And we were set up to have an awards once a year. And then on the back of that, uh, Shawnee, we have uh, the Sport for Good Foundation, uh, which uh, Nelson Mandela was our founding patron. And he gave us the words that sport has the power to change the world. And sport speaks a language that, that children understand. And we now support over 200 pro projects globally. Um, sport-based projects uh, that use sport to break down discrimination, uh, change lives, and, and it's been it's been amazing. We've raised over 150 million euros to distribute amongst those uh, 200 odd projects in 45 countries. And you know, over that 20 years, we've changed the lives of over six million children. So uh, we're very passionate about it. Uh, we love what we do, but you know, these times during COVID have been really challenging for the projects. Um, because a lot of the children have had a, haven't had a safe environment to go to. So, you know, we've been working really hard to, to make sure that the, the children are safe and uh, are given opportunities like, like we were given through sport. Lucky enough to bump into Australian cricketing legend Steve Waugh, who was with you over in Hong Kong last year. Who are some of the other ambassadors that Laureus boast? Uh, we've got 69 academy members. Uh, we've got 130 ambassadors, uh, rugby players. We've got Brian O'Driscoll and our newest academy member, Brian Habana, who obviously you know very well. <laughs> um, but, you know, through through my generation, you know, Ian Botham, Viv Richards, Jack Nicholas, uh, Edwin Moses, uh, the great 400 metre hurdler, uh, Nadia Comaneci, Katerina Witt, uh, Chris Hoy, um, the list goes on. Emerson Fittipaldi, Fabian Cancellara, uh, Del Piero, Cafu, uh, Raul, uh, you know, Louis Figo. And I, I'm, I'm just reeling these names off. And I'm like a kid in the candy shop. I'm, I'm the chairman yeah. of the academy. And I just, I get blown away. You know, you and I were, were, were at um, Annabelle Bond's place last year and, and to have Michael Johnson there. That great, great sprinter, and what a and what a cool cat as well. They all they all seem so yeah. giving of their time. They seem so committed to it all. I just you know I went up to Martina Navratilova. She was a fa founding member, and I I just, I, just, I couldn't believe it. Martina Navratilova. This is in two thousand. I went, Martina, can, can I please have your autograph? And she said no. She said, I want your auto your autograph. I'm like, wow, you've got to be joking. How do you know me? But yeah, we're, we're, we're all good people, like-minded people. Um, and just the sport is, you know, especially in these times too, Shawnee, with with what's going on at the moment, um, sport is, is such an important part of people's wellness. And to have, to have rug live rugby on this weekend is, is helping people get through this. And, you know, for, for us up here in the UK, um, you know, we, we don't know when we'll be able to go to a stadium again, but to, to see what's happening in New Zealand um, is, is great. Sport unites people. We were going to get to that a little bit later, the uniting of uh, people coming together around Super Rugby, which, as you say, kicks off this weekend. Let's let's climb into it now because it's kind of probably the most exciting bit of news we've had for a little while on the rugby front. Super Rugby back. So we've got the five Kiwi teams going at it and we were chatting just before uh, hitting record on this little catch up. And you were telling me that they've already sold, what, 30,000 tickets yeah, at Eden Park to the Blues Canes game. 
you know, I'm really optimistic in terms of, of world rugby going forward. Um, I think we've got a real opportunity uh, here. You know, 25 years we've been going in pro sport. I was there day one when we when we went to, into the professional game. And we haven't had a, a moment to sit back and, and push the reset button or look at what we've been doing really well and look at things we, we're not doing so, so well. There's been some horrendous um, uh, financial decisions that have been made. And I think COVID has exposed a, a lot of that. So what we're seeing this weekend uh, in New Zealand with the five franchises playing each other is a competition that is hugely appealing. Mm. You know, why? Because we're going to have we're going to have a great rugby. We've got tribalism. We've got huge rivalry. Um, we've got a competition that we understand. You know, home and away, and then we have a winner, um, which reminds me, just takes me right back to '96 when we had the Super 12. Mm. That was a brilliant competition, a great product, um, and then we got carried away, and you know, more is better, which which we're seeing this weekend. Less less is better. So I'm optimistic and you know, I've, New Zealand's going to embrace it and, and hopefully that will have a flow on effect. I think Australia is going to go down the same road. Um, as Michael Liner said to me yesterday, maybe the rugby won't be quite as good, um, but we're going to have some great, <laughs> we're going to have some great, great rivalries, which, which, which is great for, for TV. And that's what world rugby is looking at in terms of, of producing products that are appealing to a TV audience. It's amazing uh, this end of the world. Uh, Rugby League commenced uh, last week and it has been incredible how quickly everyone's climbed on board. And I'm thinking, I'm hoping, I'm guessing it'll be exactly the same for Rugby. A little shot in the arm for it down here in Australia. What will happen in terms of the direction of uh, this little mini super series in NZ? Who will walk away, do you think, with uh, the title in a couple of months? Well, I, I'm not too sure, but I, I know the Blues are, are very optimistic. I've sort of been, been following them with, you know, Biden, Biden Barrett making his debut on Sunday afternoon, and 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 DC Carter at uh, at the age of, of 38 pulling the pulling the boots on. But that's you know it's, it's great for the profile of the game, and you know the Crusaders are always going to be difficult to beat. The Hurricanes Hurricanes look good. I see they've sold about 15 to 20 thousand down in Dunedin for, for the Highlanders game. And then you've got Warren Gatland, who's just been voted in this part of the world, the greatest coach ever, um, coach, <laughs> coaching the, the Chiefs. So, you know, we've got, we've, we've got some great coaches. Um, we're on the back of, of, you know, a lot of these guys played in the, in the World Cup. Uh, so they've got a, a point to prove. Um, it's the start of, of the next cycle before, before we go to France and they've got everything to play for. And there'll be some names that we've never heard of, Shawnee. I'm sure you, you are over it better than I am, but there's some names that will come out of this, you know, this, this competition, Aotearoa, um, that we've never probably heard of as, as the super, super rugby seems to throw in every year. What have you been like trotting around as a 38 year old? Do you reckon you could have made it that far into your career? <laughs> I walked off the field when I was 34. Uh, my last game was against Wales at, at Wembley in 1997. And I said to Zinzan as I walked off, uh, I had, he had a bad knee. And I said to Zinni, Zinni, I just can't do what I used to be able to do because of this bloody knee. And he said, Fitzy, you need to retire, mate. And <laughs> I said, that, that was not quite the answer I was looking for, Zinni, but at 38 years old, 38 years old, there's, I don't think there's any way I could have been running around a field. I like that he didn't even try and talk you out. Get yeah, on your bike, fella. Out you go. Okay, so let's get to now uh, your time in All Blacks Colours over 90 tests with NZ, obviously captain for a large part of that. This is rivalry week that we're rolling out with yeah. via the World Rugby Channels. Obviously, the rivalries surely don't come much bigger than your clashes against the Wallabies through what was a fairly dominant period of uh, Aussie and NZ rugby. Yeah, I sort of, I, I played my first test, um, it was in 1986, we played the French, and then my second test was against Australia at Athletic Park, and Australia hadn't, hadn't done too much prior to that. I'd sort of grown up in the, in the 70s watching, watching the All Blacks dominate Australia, really. Um, I think the only one they sort of won really was in 78, I think, when Greg Cornelson scored those four tries at Eden Park. But 
in in 86 they were just starting to sort of express their themselves you know steve tyneman michael liner far jones um they were just starting and they won that series uh two two one and it was just probably should have been three nil because i think tyneman scored a try at, at uh carisbrook um, that wasn't allowed but they became our greatest rival and i can always remember in 87 when when we uh, won the world cup we were over the moon that the French beat Australia um, because in doing that, we wouldn't have to play Australia in the final, who, who we really respected. And they were coming of age, that great team of 84, the Grand Slam team that, that went mm. through and, and, and dominated in this part of the world. So when we played Australia in the Bledisloe Cup in 87 after the World Cup, I think it was only two weeks or 10 days after the World Cup final, we played Australia. And, and that was a, that was almost like a World Cup final. No disrespect to the French, um, but we saw the Australians as a real dominant force, and and we held, held them in great great respect. Um, and then and then we dominated for the sort of the next few years. And then I can always remember Kernsey, and you probably remember a bit as well as I do, Shawnee, when Kernsey scored that try in Wellington in 1990. I think it was a, might have been the third test or second test. And he gave me the, the two finger salute. <laughs> and it was the first time Kernsey had ever expressed himself doing anything to me. I was in his ear the whole time. You're just a baby. Tommy Lawton should be here, all this stuff. And then Kernsey finally got one over me and, and just literally gave it to me. And, and they turned the corner. And I, I, still, I still thought I was the best hooker in the world. But little did I know that Kernsey had actually overtaken me. And, and by 1991, Australia was such a dominant force. You know, the game at, at Lansdowne Road in our semi-final, the game was over at half time. Um, that's how dominant they had become. And I, I take my hat off to what they you know, did during that time. And it wasn't really to 92 that we thought, right, okay, we need to turn the table on Australia. You know, ELZ, Far Jones, Lioner, they had some great names in, the, in those teams. Willie Offen Garway, Tim Gavin, you know, I could reel all the names off Daly, you know, McKenzie, mm. um, just really dominant players through, through that period. And then they almost did what we did in, in 87 to 91. They, they dominated for a while and then they started to get a bit fat and lazy. <laughs> and, and, and then we, we, we jumped over them. But great rivalries. I, I loved playing, playing Australia. Um, I've become mates with with a lot of the guys I played against. You know, I just you know Timmy Horan, Jason Little. I can remember Jason Little. We're playing at Athletic Park once, <laughs> and uh, we were they, they were just like they were just great rivalries. I mean, I can remember tripping this Jason Little. I was thinking, geez, he's, he's getting a bit bloody big for his boots. So as he was running across the field, he I tripped tripped him up, and this is miles off the plate. And, and with that, he turned around and just went, boom, <laughs> punched me in the nose. And I was like, wow. <laughs> but that was, you know, we had, some, uh, we had some great matches, you know, against, you know, Far Jones. You know, obviously Michael and, Michael and I have, you know, we, years of having breakfast together, together cap, uh, covering the Super Rugby up here. We spoke about, you know, because we weren't, weren't great mates when we played against each other. Um, but we've become great mates off the field, which is which is a good thing. Can you go back to that moment in 1990 with Kernsey? Am I right in saying that a few years down the track after he gave you the, the two fingers that you two starred in a bank advertisement alongside <laughs> one another? Is that right? Yes, we did. We, we were holding hands. Uh, I think it was that's, the, that's uh, right. the bank. It was, uh, I don't know, I'd have to remember which bank it was, but it was a supermarket and, and, and the bank were coming together um so two two great rivals joined forces basically and it was a photo and the, it was a clip of kernsey and i walking up the road and the, and the, the final shot was us walking into the distance and we, we were holding hands and uh, which yeah you know, i always remember my father saying to me for christ's sake son what are you bloody doing do you need some money or something you know <laughs> I've never actually asked Kernsey the question, despite working with him for a, a number of years. What did he actually say to you when he was giving you that spray after he crossed for that try in '90? I actually don't know if he said too much. Actually, I, I yeah, people said that, you know he invited me to a barbecue or something, and I'll give you two sausages. 
Um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, he was just, yeah, well, you can imagine what he said to me. Mate, that's still the one iconic uh, image that we try to roll out before every Bledisloe, thinking we still have a shot before they actually call time on in each game. So we, we hang to that still in this part of the world. I think I th when I look at those great rivalries, Shawnee, but you look at you look at that was 1990, you beat us in 91. But I think the greatest Bledisloe Cup series I was involved in was in 92. Mm. Um, we, we lost the series 2-1, but I think over the three games, we scored, I think, almost exactly the same number of points, both teams, exactly the same number of tries. And it wasn't until the third, the third test that we won. You know, we, we lost in Sydney, then we just lost in Ballymore, and, and then came back and, and won at, won at the, the football stadium. But a great, ser a great series. It was a great series. There were obviously huge names that you played against, but alongside, I mean, some of the names that you can rattle off that wore the All Blacks jersey at the same time as you guys that you were lucky enough to captain. Take me through some of those blokes and share some of your thoughts around uh, what they brought to the table in international rugby. Oh, wow. We, you know, you look at that, the World Cup team at 87 through to, <clears throat> through to, to 91. Yeah, we... We went in great shape in '86, uh, and then along came Michael Jones. Uh, a lot of you know Zinni was sort of on the, on the outskirts in those times, but we just really developed into a, a team of guys that wanted to to be the best in the world, really, and we were very motivated. Uh, we we challenged each other a lot. Um, you know, you know the Gary Wertons, the Murray Pierce, uh, Buck Shelford. Um, you know, just all the, all these names, and you, then you look at you know Walter, you know Walter Little, but you know before that Warwick Taylor, John Schuster, Joe Stanley, uh, J.K., you know Jonah Lomu, uh, Christian Cullen, uh, Terry Wright, um, all these players, you know, went on to be to be great great All Blacks, and you know I think you know Australia brought the best out on us. Mm. Uh, they, were, they were always challenging us and you know and that and as i said in that period from sort of 92 to 96 97 you know i think probably the greatest game and 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 john hart who was a coach in 96 says it was probably the best display by any all black team at athletic park uh, when campo gave us a little bit of motivation by not facing up to the harker and going around and kicking the ball down the end of the field with all his mates um by himself and was so was this was ninety was ninety six uh ninety six was the one where the Wallabies went back to the twenty two and Eelsie took them back with the hit shields wasn't it and while yeah. you did the Harker yeah they went through pre game drills what was what was the chat when you had just done the Harker and they were still down at the other twenty two not aiming up Shawnee there's there's no there's no chat at all really because it did, it doesn't matter the Harker's about us we're we're mm -hmm. laying down a challenge and and you can do what you like um but we were just in the in the right frame of mind i suppose and the harker was it was a good harker um the conditions were shocking and and we just played the game of our lives and and australia unfortunately never never got into the game so um it was just a, a complete performance by a group of guys and there was a lot of new guys in that team young guys you know kelly had just sort of broken onto the onto the scene uh mertz was was on fire um, so, you know, Marshy just start, started playing. So, mm. you, know, you know, you take from, from 86 to 96, it was almost a, a changing of the guard in terms of a lot of those young guys that came on and, and then they, they created their own, own legacies. Going this way and that, how did the rivalries with the Springboks shape up? Obviously, they didn't front up again until I think it might have been 92. But was it as big back then as it is now, that All Blacks v Springboks rivalry? Or was that sort of developed over the years, do you think? Well, I, I, I sort of grew up in a generation where we, we each used to watch the Springboks play the All Blacks. So, you know, for us, the rivalry and the sort of, you know, right through the the time of the All Blacks playing the Springboks was probably, a, no disrespect to Australia, but it was probably our number one rival. Uh, we saw them as the greatest mm. challenge. I When I became an All Black, I, I thought I'd never play the Springboks because uh, it was during the apartheid times and then to go there in 92 um, for me was was a real honor a major challenge 
And because my generation of, of Ian Jones, uh, you know, uh, Zinzan, Michael Jones, we grew up watching them. So we understood the, the rivalry where with somebody like a like a Mertz or a Cully, they didn't really sort of understand because they hadn't hadn't watched those those great, you know, the 81 tour to New Zealand, the 76 tour to South Africa by, by the All Blacks. And then in, to go back there in 96 and to win a series there, um, we had to do a bit of education to the young kids about uh, what it meant to the All Blacks to win a series in South Africa. We'd never done that before. Um, and then to, to walk off the field at Loftus Versfeld, having won a series in South Africa, um, winning that second test, to have the great Don Clark, who had lived in South Africa, he was one of, one of the great All Black fullbacks. And he came up to me, tears rolling down his face in the tunnel, and he hugged me. And, and in those days, we didn't do a lot of man hugs. <laughs> and, and with that, he, he said, he said, Fitzy, thank you so much for bringing a team to South Africa and beating them in a series. I can go to my grave as a happy man, knowing the All Blacks have finally won a series in South Africa, uh, which which is pretty cool. You know, for me, it's you know it's one of one of my greatest achievements in rugby was, you know, to lead a team uh, to the Republic and 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 win that win that series. I know it's very hard to drill down, but which of those games would it be? Ninety six v Aussies the. Uh, most memorable afternoon in an All Blacks jersey, or would it be uh, over there in South Africa getting that job done in that series? Uh, I've been asked that question a few times. Like, you know, I, I look back, and, and as I said, that was for me so satisfying because it was such a major challenge um, to go there. In those days, we played because it was still that was the start of um, the, the Tri Nations. Mm. I think we played something like eight or nine tests in, in 11 weeks. Um, you know, we played we played four tests against South Africa back to back. Uh, the week before, we played up at um, in Brisbane, um, and then we had the went to Cape Town to play the last game of the Tri Nations before going to to Kings Park for the start of the series. So, yeah, I think '96 um, against the Springboks was for me just was just such a great memory. And I suppose after what happened in '95, also, you know, which which is, is you know. One of one of the great days in rugby, and and even though we we're on the wrong side, um, I think it changed the the face of of South Africa sport, and 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 of sport globally. And you know, you and I were in, in in Japan last year at that final, and to see what that meant to South Africa, winning winning that World Cup, once again we go back to back to Laureus in terms of the power in sport, how, how it just unites people and and it makes people smile. Even though, even though we lost in '95, even though you lost in '95, see, Khaleesi might make a nice ambassador for Laureus at some point as well. Yes, very much so. He's uh, he's an amazing man. He could work out real well. Yeah, he he, he certainly is that. Now, Fitzy, we normally wrap up these uh, podcasts and vodcasts with some sort of quick fire questions that we ping in at our guests. This is a fairly easy one for you. Uh, the best you played with. And the best you played against in terms of all players players who yeah who's the best player you played alongside and who's the best player you've gone up against yeah okay so i, I played with some amazing players i always answer this question and and uh, the person i'm going to mention more often than not picks me also so it's quite nice <laughs> <laughs> if i if i was going to to battle tomorrow uh, and I think most most of our generation would take the same player. I'd take Zinzan Brook. Uh, just just hugely competitive. Wanted to be the best number eight on world rugby. Wanted to be the best at everything he did. Uh, you know, I've just watched that Michael Jordan series and uh, the Last Dance. And the closest person to Michael Jordan and the All Blacks would be Zinzan Brook in terms of what he demanded out of out of his fellow all blacks and just he just doesn't go away he's like so annoying you know he's one of those annoying people that <laughs> everything you everything you do you know he finishes the meal first you know you just just Cindy, can we just relax and have a nice dinner together nope i want to finish first you know he drinks his beer quicker than anyone else you know all, all these things you know and ev everything is a competition which is great and the player that i played against <clears throat> i used to I always sit in the change room, Shawnee, and, and before we play a team, I'd go through both teams 
and I'd match up, you know, Cullen versus Burke, you know, Campisi versus Lomu, and and if ninety percent of the of the team was the All Blacks, I'd be quite happy. Uh, the one player that I always enjoyed playing against uh, was was Nick Far Jones. He was a player that just he he changed changed the face of the game. Uh, hugely dominant, you know. If we knew we could dominate him, as as the Australians used to say, if we can keep Michael Jones out of the game, uh, we've got a chance of winning. And it's the same with Far Jones. He he was very inspirational, um, and and a great halfback. I like it. Um, I, used to, I used to always clip him in the air as I from the front of the line out. I'd always <laughs> run round and Far would pass the ball, and about five minutes later, I'd clip him on the back of the head. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I'd then I'd move on to Liner and do the same to him. And you still get to do it to Liner now, as you said. Over uh, you work with Sky hosting Super Rugby over there in the UK. How about this one, Fitzy? Uh, a few years from now, the grandkids are playing up, and you get to punish them with one Sean Fitzpatrick highlight on loop for a whole day. What would you nail them with? On loop, punish them with so something that. Well, yeah, they've been they've been playing up, and you're like, well, you're going to watch Granddad's highlight doing this for a whole day on repeat. What would you What would you make him watch? 1987, we we're playing Australia, and I think it was at Concord Oval after the World Cup, and I scored two tries. Perfect. On, and, and both of them, surely, both of them were on the wing. <laughs> <laughs> Over and over and over. That's... Can, I, can I tell you a quick little story about that? Have we got Have we got time for a little story? Yeah, we do, of course. So, so John Ker JK John Kerwin, who you who you know well, uh, he he got dropped in nineteen ninety three for Jeff Wilson, and uh, so Laurie Maines. I said to Laurie, "You can't drop JK. He's you know he'd be great to take <laughs> to Britain uh, because he'll educate young this young kid Jeff Wilson." And with that, he said he said, "No, nah, I'm going to drop him." I said, okay, I, I want to be in the room when you do it. And with that, he came and he said, sorry, sorry, JK, we're not taking you to Britain. Uh, you're not scoring enough tries. And with that, he looked at me and he went, do you know, Laurie, the reason I'm not scoring enough tries is because that fat hooker, captain of yours, is standing on my wing scoring all his tries. <laughs> uh, which, <laughs> which, which we laugh about now. Oh, uh, that's, that is... That is classic. That is uh, bang on the money. Now, one more to round out your chat, Fitzy. You get one rugby do-over. Can be good or bad. So you can relive a moment or you can take a mulligan and have another swing at it. What would it be? <laughs> um, uh, 95 World Cup. Okay. What would you do differently? Wouldn't have wouldn't have stayed in Johannesburg that week. Would have moved out of town. <laughs> but yeah, I no pr pr probably that's probably that's pretty unfair because it would, probably would have been the same. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't have many regrets, Shawnee. I sort of I was very very lucky, uh, and the and the losses that we had uh, typical typical in all black style. We we learnt from, and. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't have have, have many regrets uh, in terms of, you know, I was I was very very lucky, you know, I think I played ninety two internationals and we won seventy eight of them, so um, that's not a bad win record. No, it's not a bad win record, and it's a good number to close out our chat as well, Sean Fitzpatrick. I know that uh, we'll be hearing your voice via the Sky Sports UK podcast around Super Rugby. I know you can't wait to get your eyes across it this weekend as well. So you're tipping Blues to win that first up game and you've got to be tipping Blues to win the whole thing, don't you? Uh, well, I've been, I've been doing that since 2003, Shawnee, <laughs> and uh, we haven't had a lot of success. Don't change it now. <laughs> so with it. I'd love the Blues to win. Uh, Olo Brown and I went and watched a pre-season game, actually. It was against the Hurricanes at, at Only Wire Domain uh, in January, I think it was, end of January. So, you know, they've got high hopes. Um, you know, they've got a, a good coaching set up now. You know, I think Tana and, and Leon McDonald doing a great job. You know, they've got a new CEO. They've got a, got a good board. And, and, and now they've got some fans that are really excited you know, to have, you know, to have the best, you know, two, the two best tens New Zealand rugby has produced in, in many years, uh, both involved in, in the Blues. 
it can only be good in terms of attracting players. We're, you know, we've got a player from from Harlequins, Joe Marchant, who, who's been down there uh, playing, and he's just had his contract extended by, I think, a month to, to get some of these games in. Uh, but he is absolutely loving it. And I think it just shows that, you know, New Zealand rugby, and I go back to what we said at, at the start, there's, I'm really optimistic because I, I think there's some real opportunities that's going to come out of this. And uh, we need to embrace embrace it. And, and this global game needs to just to, you know, put self-interest aside and and make make sure that our great game continues. Well, hopefully you too love it this week. And uh, Sean Fitzpatrick, World Rugby Hall of Famer, former All Blacks captain, thank you very much for joining us on the World Rugby Podcast. Thanks, Shawnee.